Hello. And, and a very good morning uh, to you. I apologize about the delay. Of course, uh, it takes a couple of minutes for us to wrap up panels. Um, and uh, while we have extended the, the amount of time we speak about every, uh, uh, every area, there's never enough time uh, when it comes to such diverse and interesting scientific issues. Um, so let me first and foremost um, uh, thank you, um, Dr. Moretti, to, be, to, to, to agree to speak with us. Um, you know, I, uh, as, as, uh, just to give context to this, uh, I came across you uh, several years ago uh, when you came and presented with us in Beverly Hills, uh, and I was greatly impressed by your research and by, um, by the commitment that you have shown toward this aspect. So first, let me take this moment to introduce my co-host, uh, Anika Pampel. Um, Anika is a filmmaker, um, previously and, and currently also an actor, um, and has had a diverse career in uh, in, in ed journalism, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and has also worked on the Human Health um, Initiative with uh, uh, James and John Cameron, um, and uh, and has uh, a, a, a wonderful perspective um, of of both uh, youth as well as uh, experience in being able to put this all together. Um, so that being said. Um, I'm going to, as soon as Dr. Moore is back on, I'm going to give him an opportunity to, uh, to introduce himself. Uh, so Dr. Mor uh, Moretti, if you would be so kind as to introduce yourself, and uh, then we can start this going. Um, hello there, is that better? Good, okay. My name is Dr. Martin Moretti, and um, I trained um, in uh, medicine in England. Uh, and then uh, while I was doing my surgical internship, I got first hand experience with the issue of working 24 um, seven uh, around the clock and the issue of light. And that got me interested in the whole area of circadian clocks and circadian rhythms. Uh, and I then made a move and moved, was, uh, went to Harvard, did a PhD at Harvard Medical School and then joined the Harvard Medical School faculty where I was there for 23 years, uh, developing the whole understanding of where are the circadian clocks, how do they work, and what are, and how are they controlled by light. Um, during that time, we identified where the human clock was in the in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, is the name, uh, in the human brain. We figured out how it controlled rhythms, how it, how it related to health. And we knew light was very important. We showed that it was synchronized by light, daylight, and by and by darkness but the one thing we didn't know at that time was the fact that it actually is a small band of blue light in the spectrum that is the key and that turns out to be very important because uh, i went on formed a company um, spun a company out of harvard called circadian which works worldwide on uh, advising companies on how to run 24 7 operations all the issues to do with um, safety and performance and health. Uh, when companies are running 24 seven, we have offices around the world in, in Asia, in, um, in Australia, in Europe and elsewhere. And then uh, research started coming out in the early 2000s, showing that people who were working night shifts had much higher rates of, uh, women have 50% increased rates of breast cancer the more diabetes, more obesity, more heart disease in that population. And the evidence came together to show that actually it was related to light exposure at night. Now, the problem we faced was that light at night is something you can't avoid if you're running an industry 24 seven. If it's a factory, if it's an airline, if it's a whatever you're working, you can't avoid it. And so the question was, another key finding came along, which was, as I mentioned, blue light. And so we then dedicated our research and set up a special research group to identify what exactly is this blue light. And once we identified what it was, we realized we had the solution because you need blue rich light during the daytime to synchronize your circadian clock. But blue light at night is something we never saw as a human race uh, for the first 10,000 generations. Um, because it was dark at night and fires 
and candles have very, very low amounts of blue light. And so from that, we identified the precise spectrum. We then said, let's build LED lights that can remove, provide the blue during the day, but remove it at night. We patented that, for, and formed a company called Sakini and Zerklight, developed the technology, put lights into multiple 24-7 um, uh, industries. Uh, and we have since, because obviously it's a scaling problem, um, I've licensed the rights to some major lighting companies. And also uh, was it the, some of the core patents we had, we, had, we got the core patents in this, were licensed to a company called Chorus in, uh, uh, in California, in Los Angeles. Uh, and there is an enormous challenge here because what we're now seeing, the evidence is really clear. It's been supported by so many different places and so many much research, um, 30,000 scientific papers, I did a recent survey of 250 of the leading scientists, all concluded that we've got a big problem because in 2013 or so, we introduced LED lights and LED lights are rich in blue. So what we're now doing in the name of energy efficiency is we're dosing the population. Um, well, fluorescents also have some of the problem, but we're dosing with blue rich light. So Edison's light bulb never had the blue, now, uh, never had much blue, only about 4% blue. Now we're giving 15, 20% blue. And as we've done so, we've been able to link in my new book, The Light Doctor, which is on Substank, we've been able to link now the growth in breast cancer rates, which used to be very low, five-fold increase over the last, um, over the years, and particularly in electrified countries. So countries that got electrified early have very high rates of breast cancer. Um, countries that like India, for example, you know, it was only 30% electrified in 1990. So, and it takes five, 10 years or more to develop breast cancer. Now you're seeing a rapid increase in breast cancer in India, whereas other countries developed it much earlier. But the rates in, in sub saharan Africa with no electri electrification and below uh, 20 or less per 100,000 women. In Europe, it's over in, in densely populated regions of Europe, it's about 115 per 100,000 women. So there's a huge impact. So basically my story has been to identify the basic physiology as a Harvard professor, as an entrepreneur, develop a company to solve the problem and then license it. And right now I'm trying to communicate to the world the urgency of this because it's occurring at a time when we're banning, LE, we're banning all incandescents they go, uh, the ban is August 1st in the US. You can never get any more incandescent light after August 1st. Uh, we're banning fluorescence. Five states have already done it in the US. So now we're left with just these blue rich LEDs. And we really, it's an essential public health issue to educate the world about avoiding use of blue rich light at night. And that's the key message, avoid blue rich light at night. You need it during the day. Um, but the, and the technology is available, we've solved it. And now the business opportunity is how do you replace 50 billion lights in the world that are unhealthy, a 2.5 trillion installed base of lighting? How do you replace that? And that is a problem that's solvable, a problem that's investable to deal with Anand's uh, criteria. And that's the subject that I'm delighted to talk with this panel today. And it's been a fascinating panel so far. I've been following along with all the major initiatives that your panel members have been working on. So, but this is a problem of that scale. It affects- well, completely understood. And, uh, you know, uh, once, once one recognizes um, and, 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 and is able to understand the data-driven and well-researched um, hypothesis that you have now proven uh, beyond a doubt. Um, the the question then becomes: Is 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 your is is there a way to reach out into governments to 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 be able to have public health uh, as an issue? Uh, and and because you know, as as we saw, there are so many challenges in public health. Um, public yeah. our public health infrastructures are are severely, severely challenged. Funding is severely challenged. Uh, you know, and, and this is in develop, developed nations. And let's let's not even look at the uh, 
the, the developing nation or the underdeveloped nations. Um, you know, we we look at you know um, smoking, and if you take an example from smoking, um, and 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 the knowledge that was there, and how long it took public health uh, to move the needle uh, forward. But at the same time, we have had also other things where we've seen one person um, make a difference where, uh, you know, the, 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 the legend goes that, that one conversation with President Reagan um, solved AIDS. Yes. Right? And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, so is there a, a, a one person conversation that you can think of that would solve this problem? Well, the, the potentially is, um, I mean, he, let me tell you the core of the problem. Um, light for a hundred more years, as Thomas Edison, has all been about illumination quality, right? And it's measured by lumens. And lumens is really a measure of the brightness of light. And it only looks at a small part of the spectrum the, centered in the green that the eyes are most sensitive to. So they lumens. And then lumens per watt, as, any, as we got, concern with energy efficiency in the 2000s. It's lumens per watt. And government regulators have leapt onto that, the engineers have leapt onto that, and they don't understand that lumens per watt is not a health measure. In fact, if you optimize lumens per watt and ignore the blue content of light, which is not picked up, it's not measured in the lumens, it's off to the side of the spectrum where the lumens are measured, if you ignore that, you optimize and actually create unhealthy light because you just cannot match those efficiencies. It sounds very impressive. I'm going to move from the, the, the incandescent light bulb band is based on that incandescent lights can only do about 5, 10 lumens per watt. The standard now is 45. So therefore, halogens can't make it, incandescents can't make it. Now the proposal in, in the Department of Energy is to move it to 120 lumens per watt, which no healthy light can make, because if you put all your energy in terms of you know, producing lumens, you don't solve the parts of the spectrum um, that are healthy. And there's health in the red part of the spectrum that's not in lumens, that's a lot of healing is in the red part of the spectrum. There's health in the blue part of the spectrum and you have to control it. And that's one of the problems. So the conversation, I'd love to, yes, if I get the introduction, I'd love to have the conversation. Um, we've got to find the Reagan for this issue. But I think it is an issue where if you understand that breast cancer rates have gone f up fivefold with the exposure to blue light, if you understand that diabetes is doubled, obesity is doubled, heart um, hypertension is doubled. Dr. Mo, you're muted. And you understand, you understand this is a global this. issue. And it's not exactly complicated to fix. You just get the right light bulb and the light bulbs exist. Now there's a business issue in terms of volume. There's a business issue in terms of the lighting industry is embedded in this lumens per watt, blue pump LED. Uh, they've really driven down the price points of that, all right? They've got a legacy issue there. We've got a lighting industry a little scared, quite frankly, because think about that this is like an asbestos scale liability. They've illuminated the world with this blue pump LEDs. And, but they don't know quite how to make the switch. All their revenue comes from it. Only less than 0.5% of lights um, are circadian healthy. In other words, modify that blue content. 99.5% of lights are unhealthy. Um, and it's a real change. And it's, it's a change of understanding. And that's why, as I say, I've written this book. Uh, it's um, serialized on Substack called The Light Doctor. Um, to really start trying to educate the population, make it accessible, um, because what we know, all the scientists know this in the field, right? The scientists know, the general public doesn't. How do you, the, the, the scientists don't speak to their neighbors about it. The general public has no clue. Um, government has no clue for the most part. So it's really a big community. You know, it's a solved problem, investable problem, and a huge communication challenge. Yeah, and, and and so coming to the to, to the to the investable side of it, I mean, now you've got a corporation, you've got licensing agreements, you've got revenue streams, you've got all of that. Um, what has been the challenge in in raising capital? Is is it because family offices and um, and 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 um, funds are not interested, uh, or they don't see it, or is it just a 
purely business model of saying that the market is too hard to break into against uh, the Goliaths that are that are controlling lighting at this point. Uh, you know, for certainly, I know that you know uh, the in, the investment that's been made, as you as you inferred to in your in your in your discussion in manufacturing um, LED uh, in, in 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 its current form. Um, you know, certainly those have not been depreciated and amortized yet. So obviously, industry looks at it purely from a perspective of cash flow and 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 investor returns in saying, "Hey, we, you know, our assets are not yet depreciated." The reason, partly, the reason why they didn't say much about uh, incandescent light is because those assets have been depleted. And uh, there was no real gain from those assets anymore. And if anything, it was in their benefit to 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 switch over to to a new technology because that just meant a tremendous amount of revenue, right? In 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 the replacement of light bulbs, can we reapply that economics? Well, I think the issue is this: um, right now, the this invention is new, right? Uh, the um, and it's proven and, and and so forth, but it's new. There is a huge variety of lights. There are a huge number of markets. There are a huge number of applications, in commercial, residential, and so forth. The company that's uh, you know taking the lead and doing this, that licensed, we acquired our IP, can only do they they can only do a limited number of fixtures. They can do some linears. They can do some light bulbs, but you know to do to replace all the all the variety of lights that exist um, is a huge endeavor. They recognize that this is an investment, that this is a light, uh, the key is licensing. What the, the opportunity is to license this for any, any other market in the world, uh, for any uh, special applications for, and so forth. Though there's a very big interest in licensing this technology, which I'd love to see, because basically we need a whole info ecosystem of lights because if you think about it, if you've got a space and if you look at a typical office or other space, you've got lots of different fixtures and different types of lights and so forth in it. Um, the problem is if you just replace some of them with circadian lighting, the others are still emitting the blue. You haven't solved the problem. You've got to solve every type of light at once. So basically, I think the opportunity is a really a licensing opportunity to take markets and um, the, uh, and a very, it's a very strong patent portfolio we built which is global around this, uh, how to do this um, and how to engineer white light uh, that has got no blue in it um, during the nighttime and white light that's rich in blue and how to just simply switch between the two. So it's, it's a very doable thing. Um, it's really the rollout implementation, um, diversity of light factors, the diversity of markets challenge of how do you make a trans, how, how do you replace you know, 50 billion fixtures and lights. Completely agree. Um, I think that, you know, anytime that there's innovation, anytime that there's, especially if it's a scientific innovation for good, there's a cost associated, right? So that that cost associated will mean that um, in the beginning, uh, certainly your product is not going to be competitive uh, to a cheap LED bulb that's coming from some, you know, cheap manufacturing country and don't want to pick on anyone. Um, and, and so, so how do you, how do you, aside from the licensing side, how do you actually change minds among people? Um, you know, so as, as a consumer, um, you know, how do you reach out to consumers? How do you educate? Is the book, the, the, and your podcast, um, and, 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 and being on panels such as this being, a more in the press, more um, it, it, awareness. Is that is that the answer? Yeah. Here? Because yeah, well, awareness is what has to happen. Um, the first step is really awareness. And so basically, you know, what I um, I've done, as I say, um, I believe Annika, you're a filmmaker. So hey, we should have a conversation. Please. A documentary on this issue would be enormously effective. I've already, by the way, done documentaries. Uh, BBC did a one-hour documentary on me. Um, I've been on all the major shows today. Show Good Morning America. I'm TV ready, basically. Or, Amazing, I can tell. And I do have yeah. a follow-up question to announce. So, so, so there is a real documentary opportunity here. It hasn't broken through. I mean, it's, it's, it's always like these things. The, the obvious thing is they're banning the light bulbs this coming Monday, the incandescent bulbs. The fluorescents are going out. 
we've only got the LEDs and the LEDs have got a health problem to them. That's a pretty, you know, it ought to be a great story somehow. We ought to break, we need to break through in the media. So I'm delighted this panel is a great place to, to do it. And I'm trying to talk to panels, trying to get the, um, as I say, Substack is um, getting the book out um, online. Um, so maximum availability, it's a free subscription to get people onto it. Um, so, and any type of media film, I'm, I, I'm keen to participate in. I have a question for you, doctor. So I'm thinking about this in a very practical way. So I see a private solution as more of a matter of choice. One can replace their own light bulbs at a certain point when they become available. But what about the public sector? If you have a hospital, how does that work? How does it affect people that have to work in blue light every day? Does it affect them in a much higher level? I'm thinking about- It does. Doctors. I'm thinking about doctors that have to work under this light in a right. surgery, can't step away at any right. point in time. How is that feasible? 50% increase in the early studies showed a 50% increase in breast cancer among nurses working night shifts as opposed to day shifts, particularly premenstrual. That's where, where people are most vulnerable, right? Um, and young women, which is the bulk of who was working at night. Uh, ICU patients dying um, you know, more rapidly, uh, longer stays in, um, in blue rich lighting, all right? As opposed to circadian lighting. Um, trips and falls in elderly homes um, reduced by um, a considerable amount, um, reduced in half uh, by putting in circadian lighting into a, in an old folks home. Um, so their sleep patterns and everything are not disturbed and, they're, you know, and their, their health is advanced. People who are sleeping with the lights on at night, 50% increased risk. And by the way, huge numbers of people sleep with the lights on at night because of anxiety and so forth you know, 40% of the population, 50% more in elderly people. They have twice the rate of diabetes, twice the rate of obesity, twice the rate of um, hypertension. So there are a lot of areas and angles to this thing. Um, but yes, um, there is the light in your own space. I've got lights in this space here that are actually, you know, ideal circadian lighting because I happen to know what it is and I've got it, right? Um, and so I'm illuminated by that. Um, but, uh, and the, that's becoming available and you can make personal choices. Then the question is, how do you get institutions and places, people that spaces you don't own, don't control. Um, and that's what we did a lot of work. We got over 50 fortune 500 companies putting in these lights and we showed very significant improvements in the sleep and performance and health of those people. So, um, uh, improvements in, in obesity and weight gain and, and appetite and other issues. So we've got the studies in the Fortune 500. Now it's really a, a question of there is an awareness problem and there is a supply problem, right? So it's demand and supply and try to work both sides of that equation. The demand one I talked about, Anna, you're talking about the, uh, the awareness, which is absolutely where I've been trying to focus right now is build the awareness, find every channel I can to get the word out because it's it's a pretty simple fix. That's the wonderful thing. Screw in the right light bulb. It's not hard. You know, it's, yeah, yeah, actual, I mean, it's one of the simplest fixes if you want to think <laughs> about a public health problem. It's yeah, way yeah, simpler than simple fixes. You know, we, we're not talking about something complex here, but we're talking about, you know, uh, changing, uh, you know, uh, as you probably heard in, in other panels, I mean, my, my my personal feeling has always been that impact is all about awareness. It doesn't matter yeah. what impact you're doing; yeah. it's about awareness. Um, and 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 the right awareness creates the amount of interest. And our focus on this platform is to create awareness amongst family offices, among global leaders, thought leaders, um, and 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 hopefully make that. Uh, something that then, um, uh, you know, sparks a change uh, because they think that awareness requires investment. Yeah. You know, um, you know, awareness now is, uh, you know, if we do, if we do, if we're to equate it with, uh, with the state of elections today, mm -hmm. you know, and say, okay, politicians today spend obscene amounts of money uh, yeah. for creating awareness for whatever message they may have from whatever side they may be from. Um, and to compete in that environment, the noise that's out there today, plus the fact that there's so much disinformation or misinformation or 
however you want to characterize this. Now, is that an issue for you? Uh, it is in part because the first response, there is something about lighting. It's a technical term called C color temperature, CCT, uh, which is measured in Kelvin. And it's um, and so basically the the lighting industry confronted with this challenge said, oh, yes, we've got lights of different color temperatures. Um, you know, the bluer, white, the whiter lights are higher color temperatures, like 4,000, 5,000. Let's just have things that vary between 4,000 and 3,000, for example, and we'll call them circadian, right? Um, the reality is they're all based on blue pump LEDs. So you might go from 15% blue to 8% blue when really you need to go down to less than 2% blue, right? But so we're dealing with that. So there's a communication issue. There's an education. I'm doing education programs within the lighting industry and the distributors, the, um, uh, the sales channels and everything else, trying to get that definition of what is true versus false circadian lighting. So that's more of a thing, less for the general public, but more for the industry to make sure they, you know, we, they, they, they hold to something that actually is valid. Um, but the other issue is just sort of people starting to know that they, they need to be concerned when um, every light bulb in their home is a static LED that will be pumping out blue no matter what. And, um, and that's something to change. The problem is cost. There is a cost problem because a, a light that changes between two states and knows the time of day, knows when it's sunset and knows when it's sunrise, is a bit more complicated, a bit more tech to it. Um, uh, tech's all developed, but it's it's got to come down the price curve um, with volume. Um, right, and that was going to be my question in, in saying to you is that, you know, affordability of course has always been a, a, a key part of it. Um, power consumption wise, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, uh, are we absolutely. going back to the power consumption of incandescent lights uh, or are we staying somewhere in the middle? N nowhere close. No, that you can compromise. Here's the story. Um, incandescence, uh, power, you know, the lumens per watt metric is about five. Um, fluorescence, you can get up to about 50 or 60 lumens per watt. Um, uh, the, as I say, the most efficient LEDs now are getting up towards 200 lumens per watt potentially. Right, but they're very intensely blue pump LEDs. We've been able to get them of uh, um, 75 now going up to 100. We're getting there. You need to trade off a little bit of that energy efficiency in order to get health. Um, but it's not, it's, it's certainly the trouble so is we can yes. meet the 45 standard. This new standard of 120 is really a killer because it's very hard to meet that and have a healthy light. And that's what we have to, one of the things, big battles we have to fight in the US right now. And I, the EU may be considering, I'm not quite familiar what the exact status of that is, maybe considering that type of lumens per watt. And that's an education issue because light right. is not just lumens. Light is also all the health parts. Sunlight is, is, sunlight is actually rather poor in lumens per watt because it's got all the other richness of the, of the spectrum. Right. No, that makes sense. Um, you know, when we when we when we look at kind of the uh, numbers that you're talking about, fifty percent increases in critical diseases. These are not small numbers. No, no, this no. is not this is not statistically insignificant. No. That that somebody can talk it away and say that you know that that this is a thing. Now, if uh, you know, I, I, I recall you did do a, 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 a experiment with nurses in and and at night, uh, if I if I remember correctly, and uh, and those findings were very significant, and it led to certain change. Um, so, have you been able to see um, change in behavior uh, when you are when you are you know uh, able to present this to the right person? Well, yes, because I mean, we made, um, as I say, when I developed my company, Circadian Zirklight, we're just a small startup, right? And we were able to get our lights into over 50 Fortune 500 companies. Um, the, the, the argument is appealing. If you talk to the guy who's responsible for um, facilities, he doesn't really care. If you talk to the person responsible for the health and performance and well being 
of the workforce, right? And and he wants the people wants absenteeism to be low. He wants people to be productive. He wants them to be healthy. It's an easy sell. And so we've been able to sell that concept to people, you know, um, and done it over and over again in a lot of the largest companies from Chevron onwards, right? Uh, we put lights into their um, Duke Power and uh, all sorts of places that we put lights into. Um, so um, that 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 is that's a sellable concept, but you have to get to the right person because the you know the, there are a lot of companies that said, okay, we've got sustainability, we've got a guy, we're going to bonus on how rapidly he can reduce the energy consumption of our company. Um, uh, so um, that guy is not going to be interested in the solution, um, you know, because he, he doesn't want a solution that's less effective, even though it's pretty effective in terms of. So energy in, in theory, what I would what I would say to you is that is that you know when we talk about public health, especially in the developed world, um, and, and 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 especially in the U.S., when we look at insurance companies, yes, right. Um, cost increases for insurance companies based on this, the same as, again, I would equate it back to smoking or back to, um, you know, some of the other vices that, uh, that, that, that insur insurers have, uh, you know, really, really come down hard on. Uh, you would think that, uh, and smoking was causing less, you know, it was not 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, so, I mean, I would assume that at some point an actuarial table will show this. And, and be able to present this to an insurer um, and they will be able to look at this as would, you know, um, the NHS in the UK or, or any public health system where there, there, there's delivery of care associated with cost. Uh, right. And so, you know, so it, it would seem to me that there would be a medical argument, um, you know, a very significant one uh, for insurers and reinsurers, especially uh, that are that are stuck with tail risk that that this would be the right way to go uh is that an area that you've explored and well, hold on I, Arthur, if, if you wouldn't mind add on to it the reaction of big pharma the opposite side i would love to hear how that went big pharma to this yes like an <laughs> insurance companies they have of course a positive interest but i would like to hear the other side as well yeah well there's a, there's a, i mean i'll tell you a little anecdote about insurance companies um we developed in, in our consulting company a solution whereby we could predict which employee was going to have the accident next. In other words, we could figure out who was going to get fatigued, who, whose circadian system got so disrupted that they were going to become a liability, drivers on the road or whatever. Um, and we put our, an insurance company that brought us in because of the huge accident rate of one company. We reduced that accident rate by 75% when we put our solution in. Um, and uh, it's a, basically a software solution uh, that basically tracks everybody and says, this is a person at risk, keep him home, um, you know, have someone else do the job. That solution ended up with the insurance company making a fortune the first year, right? Because their premiums are high, but the payout was very low. The second year, the company self-insured and the insurer lost the client because the, the, insure, the company said, this is a no-brainer. I'll self-insure myself at this effectiveness, right? And that sort of taught me something about the dynamics of, I, I assume the insurance companies would love this, right? Yeah, they yeah. Don't. logically, I mean, they if don't. you follow logic, this you want, be... you want You want premiums. They want premiums as high as possible, but as predictable as possible. They want the loss ratio to be a you know very substantial thing, but very high, right? Right. If I bring it right down, it's, you know, and the company goes self-insured, keep me away from this stuff yeah uh, i see the i see the uh uh the dichotomy here this is quite it's interesting really, uh, it was an education i tell you what i got through i couldn't you know it was staggering yeah so no i mean i uh i completely see that um anika you know in 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 the movie business now let's talk about the movie business and and you know the movie business is 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 probably the you know single most concentration of lighting that we possibly see. Um, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, it really depends because color temperature is really a big deal for us, right? And color yeah. temperature, any and all of this daylight, nighttime, we're very specific about all of those little details. And 
if it has the same outcome, if we can change HMIs to the exact same color, to the exact same output, then it'll work. But otherwise, it'll probably take the film industry the longest to change those light bulbs. Even knowing that, you know, actresses uh, in the female would be more susceptible to breast cancer and, and all that sort of stuff, do you think that that would be an advocacy side of it um, that would be interesting to look at because uh, one would think that uh, you know self preservation is, a, is is good motivation. I I mean I love I love self preservation, but I want to pivot back to pharma. If we bring this argument that people are going to be healthier back to pharma, self preservation isn't what they're going to think about first. Um, so you know, talking about the film industry, it would be lovely, and I think advocacy is really important here. Um, however, currently, if it adds to the cost of a movie, you know, we're in the middle of a strike. I can tell you what happens when costs are added onto a project and how long that pushes a project out, and how hungry people get in the meantime. So. I'm guessing that it's going to be a while for the film industry to add light bulb changes. Interesting. Um, yeah, no, so that, that, that's, a, that's a really good perspective. So coming back to the commercial side of it. So if, if, if I were to look at, you know, today you've got, uh, how many designs for, for light bulbs are your licensees providing uh, Dr. Moretti? Well, a limited number right now. There's a family of um, uh, linear lights for offices, um, but the you know it's a limited family. There is a group, set of uh, lights coming. Where my the company that's you know taking the most activity right now is bringing a, a suite of light bulbs in, which are you know which automatically different types of two different skews of light bulbs, but there is a wide range. I mean, that's all they can handle is getting that limited lines, right? But you need to have, um, if you're lighting an office space, you want troughers, you know, the standard panel stuff in the ceiling. Right. You want down lights, uh, you want linears, you want wall washers, you know, you want, there's a, there's a family of them. And we're at that stage where um, their resources in terms of getting, you know, a whole family of lights going is slowing down. And that's where, as I say, there's a, they're very keen to do licensing deals have uh, people who will take on segments of the market and um, you know with this technology um, so that's that, that that's that's what I'd like to you know I'm encouraging that I did get acuity one of the largest lighting companies I did before I did this transaction I did license the rights to them um, I also licensed the rights to HE Williams two major lighting companies in the US um, but again uh, it's partly a demand problem. They're waiting for the demand to for this stuff to come, you know. So we, we've got to sort of grow supply and demand at the same time, facilitate right. facilitate the demand and facilitate the licensing at the same time. Uh, do the education that people start to insist, um, you know. I, basically, uh, you, you know, you could people you could see <laughs> you know, whether it's a campaign. That you give old nurses, uh, you give them little stickers and you know the, put put on the LED lights and say not safe for use at night. Um, you know whatever campaign, grassroots campaign. I don't know, but how do you get it out there? Um, but it's something I think a lot of people are getting passionate about. Um, and as I say, my job is to provide the science. It's no longer equivocal. It's no longer vague. I did a survey of 250 of the leading scientists really just to basically show there was consensus in the people in the science. Um, and uh, so it's no longer a question. It's not just uh, Dr. Moreed out there with his, um, you know, campaign hat on doing a, a lone man show. It, it is a whole scientific community that knows this. Um, and so it's really just time to, how do we get this message out? So the, in, talking about message, um, why don't we have a message from you? And why don't you tell our viewers um, about your um, availability, the companies, uh, how can they get involved? How can they be um, you know, a part of this transition that needs to happen? Uh, because obviously if something is causing this kind of devastation and, and, and it will only increase um, as we become more and more um, dependent on this light, uh, uh, especially nighttime, uh, what is your message to uh, the world today and how can the world get involved? 
Well, the technology now is, exists and is proven for healthy lighting. And healthy lighting has to contain blue, light that's blue and rich during the day and light that has the blue element of it removed during the nighttime. The technology is available and, it, and the controls are available. Um, a few companies are starting to bring technologies to market, but we've got a world that needs this light uh, and it needs to be for every residential application, uh, every uh, commercial application, uh, anywhere. And most of us spend 90% of our time indoors um, exposed to the wrong type of lighting. We get too little blue during the day and, and um, too much blue at night. The opportunities are uh, you know, to uh, participate in this uh, in either on the manufacturing side, the sales side, the distribution side, um, and certainly the education side. Um, the demand is growing um, and we need supply to, uh, supply to match the demand. Um, there is a Chorus, is a company in California uh, that is, uh, specializes in uh, human light interaction. Uh, and has a very comprehensive set of patents in this. That part of our, that's where we license our patents. Um, and they're very keen to do licensing deals. And I can help facilitate uh, anybody who's interested in potential licensing deals um, to be able to make products, lighting products, and market lighting products that are circadian and healthy. Is there a website that they can go to for more information? Uh, how do they access your book? How do they access your podcast? Right. Okay. My uh, my book is uh, Light Doctor um, uh, Martin Moore Ead uh, subs, dot, substack dot com. Um, my website is uh, circadian dot com, uh, and you can reach me through that. Um, and I uh, and you can also uh, reach me through my email at mme at circadian dot com. I'm delighted, as I say, to answer any questions and to help facilitate. Um, and I think, as I say, it's, there's a very worthwhile and, um, and uh, uh, beneficial uh, business opportunity, as well as a healthcare need here that we can address. Thank you so much for your time, um, Dr. Maureen. I think that we've certainly had, um, you know, an, an education on this, and I think we need to have more of this discussion and I think what we'll try to do is on the next the next time we have you on, uh, we'll try to bring some of the uh, uh, the other manufacturers on board and 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 have a panel about light okay. uh, and and to and to see how this can actually be uh, a collaborative effort, uh, not yeah. as an adversarial one, but more a collaborative effort of taking this forward in a, into the mass markets. Uh, and, and you know, obviously there needs to be some amount of patience as new technology uh, develops, as you yourself continue your research uh, and make your products better. Uh, and as, as the standards that are, that are being set are met uh, or the standards revised, um, taking into account all of these things. Um, but I think that investing in our own well-being is certainly worthwhile for everyone. And I think that uh, you know, if I've learned something from this is, is that I'm going to be looking for this company in, in LA and I'm going to be finding whatever lighting they have possibly for me. And I didn't expect an email from me asking you specifically for how I can change my whole uh, household uh, to these smart lights so that uh, I can sleep better because, you know, yeah. certainly I've got a, a shield on my phone uh, to block blue light, and I'm not sure if it does anything at whatsoever. Uh, you know, and I've got a shield on my laptop that supposedly blocks blue light. But again, I would think that that probably also yeah. is just more marketing than anything else uh, and more peace of mind than, than, than reality. Uh, but, you know, it's not just about the major lights. Uh, you know, today's electronics, uh, we have blue light emanating from... Uh, light sockets from smart yeah. plugs from yeah. you know right. from uh, from any kind of electronic device that has any kind of uh you know a uh, touchpad to it uh so it's not it's not just a simple solution of 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 changing the just the light bulbs but we have to change our mindset and we have to change industry mindset uh yeah. you know and and make this something that is 
universally accepted as the, re the, 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 the truth. And of course, that takes time. Yeah, the, and just to add one more thing, I didn't mention it, but the display screens, just as, as we're, what we're talking, all of us looking at right now, are emitting blue rich light. There are now display screens that have this technology in them and that now can change from blue rich during the day to blue depleted at night without changing the color gamut very much. Um, and they were just demonstrated at, um, at display, um, display meeting in uh, Los Angeles just recently. Um, so that technology is available and a lot of the major companies that are currently discussing about getting that technology on. So we, you're absolutely right. We need to address the display screens, um, but the technology solution is there light bulbs, fixtures, everything to do about the light we get exposed to. And don't forget to get out during your mornings and take a walk in the sunlight because that is by far the best source of blue rich light. Um, Amazing, yeah. So thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Moretti. Annika, did you have any final questions for Dr. Ed? Uh, so many, but we'll do that in the documentary. Thank you so much, <laughs> Doctor. this was lovely. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to follow up with you. Very have, good. have a wonderful day. Okay, thank you. Bye.